Welcome back, traders and investors, to Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep, brought to you by MarketFi. I'm your co-host, Joel Alconan, along with Brianna Valeski. And we have Anne-Marie Band on the line. She's an author and financial analyst now residing in snowy Michigan. Anne-Marie, how are you doing today? <laughs> I am doing great. I actually took advantage of this snow and walked out in it this morning. It's just the most beautiful powder. I'm still a kid at heart when it comes to snow. It's just great. Okay, before we get to the markets now, I think you were on when I was gone on vacation and it was right around the the holiday season and uh I just <laughs> how'd that holiday season go for you there? I know you got what do you what do you have? Uh, a dozen kids or something like that? Do you... <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> yeah, it was good. It was really good. Um, always, always fun holiday time. And uh, you know, it was different. It was different because we're all spread all over the country now. Oh, but okay. it was, uh, you know, it was good. It was really, really good. Yeah, I was just wondering, like, how you hand. I mean, you must go shopping for weeks uh, to cover all those kids, or do you just kind of like pawn them off on each other and say, you know, okay, you know, seven versus eight, you guys get each other gifts. Do you do that, or do you just do you, do you get everybody gifts? Well, what we normally do is we give an allotment to them for, you know, here's what, here's, this is yours, and you go do whatever it is that you want to with it. And so we've let them do that for a number of years, let them just choose what it is that they want to do with their own funds. And it ends up being, you know, pretty great fun. Okay. Not so much fun in the markets, though. I mean, starting with uh, the 31st, we had a sell-off in the markets, and a lot of volatility getting things started, even a lot of volatility in today's session. And uh, you kind of mentioned before we came on that people are trying to position themselves in the market, you know, for their yearly investments, and it might not just be time yet. Uh, what do you make out of this uh, early volatility? You know, I think that's exactly what it is. People, there's all kinds of uh, thoughts people have in the market, right? They are saying, you know, last year I missed out on the great big run. That's not happening to me this year. Or um, the people who've been perma bears saying, all right, now it's time. I'm going to get in. And then, you know, remember one of the first times we talked towards the last part of the quarter, I said, do you see all this negative divergence? The chart is going to pull back. And so that's happened, and now we're sitting in a space where everybody's jockeying with all these different ideas, and nobody with weight is winning. And so we have candlesticks that are moving back and forth and retracing, and so people that are used to buying the breakouts or selling the breakdowns are getting creamed. They're getting stopped out, and it just has been a very frustrating event. The trick is to figure out when in the market it's time to sit on your hands. And I do believe in grand state that that is where we're at. This is not a place to accumulate, and it is not a place to sell to open. It's just a place to sit tight and watch it settle out to see who wins. And so that's what we're doing. I mean, there are a few things that are breaking that had really pretty breaks over the last couple of days. Twitter is one of them. That all to pull back. If it's going to continue, it's going to rest into a line of support because the market is filled with a series of trapped buyers and trapped sellers, and they're all jockeying around without really any form or purpose. And so as a technician, when we look at analysis, here's a great big thing. When you look as a technician and you say, hey, I need to analyze the chart, and you find yourself looking at it for 30, 40 minutes going, I don't know what's going on there, that's a clue. Just leave it alone. Good analysis should not take a long time. The longer time you feel that you're spending on a chart without a decision about what to do, the more likely it is that the chart is telling you not to do anything. I think Harlan Pylan, who we have on, on uh, Thursday, is all about trends, talks about that quite a bit. And, like, what if you look at a chart and if something 
jumps out to you, then it, you know it's probably a good level. Uh, Dennis and I were having a little discussion about Twitter as well, and how there was a lot of open interest in that weekly options at the forty dollar level. Uh, you know, a lot of jockeying going on. The people that had the forty calls didn't get a lot out of it. Only went out at forty seventeen. But now looking at this Twitter, I mean, this 40 is seems to be shaping up as a pretty important level here. Had some end-of-the-year tax selling and kind of found some support rounding bottom here. Uh, you, so it you, sounds like you're a little hands-off here. You're not really buying this breakout above 40. You'd look to see. You think you'll probably get it back in the upper 39 handle, maybe 38, 39 and change? That's exactly right. That's exactly what I'm looking for, because I don't think there's enough pressure forcing it to hold this 40 level. I think that still there are trapped buyers that did not expect the drift down, and they're going to be tense at this 40 level, and they're going to want to try to get rid of part of their position because they're thinking about just breaking even, and so... What I expect this chart to do is to rotate back in maybe another 70 cents or so, maybe more. I'm just going to be watching it. Right now, there's no way I would buy the breakout and watch it in this case because really, even if it does hold that level, it's going to have to do it on its own steam because the market is not going to provide a natural backdrop for more uplift. And so I'm just going to let it rotate out and see it come from a swing perspective. From the day trading perspective, if things tighten up just a little bit, it's going to be a good short intraday trade into the former levels of support. But great big candlestick action like we had on Friday, these candles are aggressive, and aggressive candlesticks have a tendency to retrace. They don't follow through without immense amounts of volume and because there's still trapped buyers in there, there's not a lot holding it up at that level. So I'm really guessing that that's going to pull back. Okay. Starting out, starting out earnings season, we had a few earnings last week. Anything's kicked off with Alcoa. Uh, today we have JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, General Electric, all big guns reporting later in the week. Uh, do you adjust your trading style at all ahead of earnings? We had, you know, kind of lay off a stock the day before and maybe the day earnings are released to see how things shake out? Or do you take the opportunity to get a little bit more aggressive, maybe in the weekly options market and, uh, you know, as we call them on the show, make some, uh, some lotto-style plays? And, you know, that really is it. It is a little bit of a crapshoot when you are trading before earnings. So what I normally try to do, we have a real specific earnings strategy that we implement. If the chart formations look solid, we'll see if the market makers, what the spread they expect in motion is what we see in line with the technicals. And if it isn't. There's some skew that may be sitting in our favor. We, we will do some sort of levered play. It'll either be a diagonal or, um, you know, something, some kind of back ratio or maybe an iron condor, something like that. But we won't do it unless we see some sort of uh, event where we have mispricing. Normally, I... I really very, very rarely ever say, okay, this is going to, this, these guys are going to blow it out. Go get the longs here. I'm, I'm always hedging around earnings because I was actually, I tell this story all the time. I was part of an ISRG trade where I did something just like that. And I was thinking that it was going to go up and <laughs> it fell about, I don't know, $103 a share the following morning. <laughs> And that's not a good one. It sort of cured me. It cured me of that kind of speculative earnings trading. Well, no, that's, I mean, everyone, you know, has their good stories and their bad stories. You know, it seems to me, when you were on last time, that, I don't know, maybe it was around earnings season or whatnot, and um, I think you were messing around in LinkedIn. Do you remember? It was Netflix, I think. Was it Netflix or LinkedIn? It was one of the two. You are correct. I think it was Netflix, though. And we held on because I was upside down in the trade. 
And it turned right around and did exactly what it is that we wanted to. You know, so the bottom line is if you hedge and lever appropriately, even if it goes wrong against you in the beginning, the form and pattern in the market will prevail. And if you have the capital to wait it out and you don't get called on margin, you're going to end up on the right side of the trade. And that's exactly what happened. It just took us a few weeks, had to roll the short uh, puts, and the chart came right back into where it was supposed to. And we got out in some good spaces. Now, that's happened with Netflix and with LinkedIn, but because we never take a trade that does not have form attached to it, all we have to do is wait it out if it runs against us. Okay. All right. And um, let's just talk about crude oil here. And uh, oh, don't, wow. don't know if you trade the crude oil futures. I or, do. A uh, lot. All right. Well, what uh, what do you think? It, you know, this. Uh, uh, hopefully, you've been playing it from the short side and aggressively at that. Uh, just talk about how you've been uh, analyzing the crude market and uh, any bottom in, in sight. Well, um, we have been trading it short. I got out just before this last bounce, and I heard a lot of people saying, this is the bottom, but a chart doesn't really do that at the bottom. It's very rare that something moving like that with that much geopolitical information all around it, that it would be a V-shaped bottom. So it's going to be sort of a rounded bottom, and it might even end up being a frying pan type bottom where it just sits flat across a space. But when the way you know a chart is holding the support regions is you watch it bounce out, you sit on your hands, and you wait for it to come back. And we were looking for it to hold the last level of support. There was somewhere around 47, and it lost it this morning. And so now it's chattering around that space. I see regions that look like about 44, maybe. I just read an article that said that the, I don't know if it's true or not, I have no way to validate, but it said that the Saudis could pull oil out of the ground for $5 a barrel and that they have no intention of slowing their production and output. And so what that's doing, of course, is squeezing everybody else because we can't do it for that. And so there, it could be that this comes all the way back down to where it was, you know, 15 years ago, down in the 30s. I, I don't have any idea. All I know is this. It's no place to take a long and it's no place to pick the bottom because nothing is stabilizing down there. It'll yeah. come up for a couple of days and then completely crash. So for us, we are looking for the bounces into resistance and the collapse of the region to go short again. And we're tra trading it in very short cycles, always against resistance and never against the break of support because we really do not know where the buyers are hiding down there. No, no, and it seems like the uh, the commercials are still very long on the inventory according to the data coming off the NYMEX exchange. Exactly. So, you know, so if they, you know, if they, when they finally puke those positions, uh, you know, maybe, I, I, from what I understand, they've, they still have almost 75% of the original position. So we'll see when, when those come off and you get the, the spike down if it's finally a low. Uh, before we let you go, we're on the line with Anne-Marie Band. Uh, she's an author and a financial analyst, uh, an author of the book, A Practical Guide to Profiting with Technical Analysis. Uh, just finishing up here on the crude you know, obviously, if you own um, oil stocks, integrated oil stocks, so what, what's the net effect on the economy? I mean, yeah, you got a little bit more money in your pocket, grocery store, you know, Best Buy or whatever. Is that, is the net effect overall good or is it uh, the havoc it's going to wreak on some of these smaller companies uh, just too much? You know, that's a really convoluted question because on one level, it really does increase the average person's buying power, right? And the people that are really hurting are these small exploration companies that can. Oh, did we lose Aunt Marie there? Okay. 
Uh, just uh, while we're talking here, uh, calling Amory back real quickly. Uh, the market's slowly losing altitude here, uh, 2032 even. Now approaching Friday's low at 31 and a quarter. Uh, big sell off here uh, with the oil negative effect as we're trying to get. Hello? Hi, Amory. Uh, did you hang up hey. on us? Did you get mad at me? No. <laughs> I was talking and talking, and then I heard the phone ring. I was like, "Wait, what's happening?" Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. So sorry you were, that. yeah, you were answering us on the um, on the crude and the overall effect, and that's when we lost you. I'm sorry about that. What I'm saying is that it's kind of a convoluted answer because there's a layer of companies, obviously, that's going to be hurt very, very badly: oil exploration, drilling, those kinds of guys, because they can't pull it out of the ground for what the going rate is. So those guys are obviously in trouble, but the average person buying uh, things, the amount of money they have to spend is increasing. What I see as the big question mark is, as oil continues to drift down, where is, where is it likely the geopolitical instability begins to occur because some country's GDP is being extremely adversely affected, like Venezuela, like Russia, like, do you know what I'm saying? Uh That is really the big question that you sit around and go, hmm, I wonder where that's going to go to. But that's that's a tough, it's a tough thing to answer because it's got so many tentacles. I think the people that are going to be doing the best are FedEx, UPS, all the airlines, anybody that has to acquire that, they go out and they get those contracts to refine for their own businesses, they are going to be doing much better. Those are the guys to watch come earnings season, right, in terms of their overall costs because they're going to be markedly lower because they're acquiring the contracts at such low prices. Well, Anne-Marie, your words of caution are certainly bearing out here in today's market. Uh, S&Ps are now down seven and three quarters points. Uh, went uh, went through Friday's low like a hot knife through butter. Uh, now trading down at uh, 2.027.50, down eight points here. Big range, already 20-point range in the S&Ps. Uh, just final words of advice. You expressed caution at the top of the show, and uh, maybe it's uh, more caution ahead. It really, really is. The thing to watch, watch the dollar, because okay. I think it's getting ready to roll, and watch the metals, because I think they're going to hold. Okay. Those are the two things I'm going to see. Those are the two things I'm looking in 2015 that are really going to start to change shape from the way they were last year. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Always enjoy when you When are you coming in to visit? I should. <laughs> yeah, World Headquarters before we move downtown. We'd love to see us. So, Anne Marine, author and financial analyst, joining us here on Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep, uh, showing caution in the markets, and uh, markets are taking note of that. All right, Anne Marie, we'll talk to you again soon. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.